suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. My name is Tom Press, and you're listening to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. I'll be your host for the next two hours. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of this most magnificent Protestant work entitled Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. Last time, we concluded on page 211, and we'll back up for continuity purposes uh, to... Uh, the second full paragraph on page 210, we're talking about what the pre-Reformation believers thought about the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John. Did they believe in a future Antichrist that wouldn't arrive in the world until just seven years before Christ's return? Or did they believe in the here and now Antichrist, the Antichrist of their time, the pro, uh, the, excuse me, the Pope of Rome. Well, so far we've found that even in apostolic times, the apostolic fathers predicted a Roman Antichrist, a Roman replacement of the pagan Roman Caesars. They predicted the Holy Roman Empire, as it was called. They said that whoever replaced the Caesars would be the Antichrist of Scripture. And they even prayed for the longevity of the pagan Roman Caesars, even though they persecuted the saints, burnt them at the stake, fed them to lions in the Colosseums, made sport of them, even burning them on crosses in mockery of Christ and of Daniel's prophecies. But we're told today that they were all wrong. The apostolic Christians were wrong. The pre-Reformation Christians were wrong. The Protestant reformers were wrong. Every Bible-believing Christian from the time of Christ up until the last three or four generations of Christians were wrong. The Pope's not the Antichrist. They say that's ridiculous. He preaches Jesus and him crucified. See, they've even got a cross with Jesus on the the cross in the churches. But do they really worship Jesus Christ, or are they making a mockery of his sacrifice for us? We're going to continue now in the second full paragraph on page 210. We're talking about true Bible-believing Christians just prior to the Protestant Reformation. And in the case of the Waldenses, who we will talk about briefly, 
and we talked about last time, that was the church, I believe, that Paul started in Rome. And because of persecution by the Romans, they fled the cities and they took refuge in the Alps. And they were known as the Valley People, the Baudois or the, or, or the Waldenses. Now we're going to talk about the Albigenses, who were closely related to the Waldenses, and they lived in the, Fran- in, the, in, the, uh, in the south of France. Now remember, France was Roman Catholic. So these, these Albigenses were Bible-believing Christians who believed mostly the way the Waldenses did, and they protested Before Protestantism was even cool, they protested the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. And because living in a Roman Catholic country, saturated with Roman Catholic priests, priests who controlled the government of France, these Albigenses were persecuted unrelentingly by the Roman Catholic Church, an attempt to completely annihilate their race and even to annihilate their history, so as from from a historical point of view, it looks as though the Albigensians never even lived. That's how that's how thoroughly the papacy persecuted and pursued these Albigensians. Now he says, in the sunny south of France, in Provence and Catalonia, lived the Albigenses. They were a civilized and highly educated people. Among these people, there sprang up an extensive revival, an extensive revival. Why revival? Because France was Catholic. There needed to be a Protestant revival, a return to true biblical Protestantism. There sprang up an extensive revival of true religion, and one of its natural effects was a bold testimony against the abominations of apostate Rome. That's right. When you think of the Albigenses, you think about their protest against the papacy and against the Roman Catholic Church. Instantly, when you hear the word Waldenses, you think the same thing. That's what identified these people, because they interpreted the prophecies on a historical point of view that the Bible, particularly the book of Revelation, constituted an entire scope of the entire Christian era from Christ's crucifixion all the way until his second coming, that Rome would dominate the world, the fourth and final empire on the world, first Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Rome was in power at the time when Christ walked the streets of Jerusalem, And Rome will be in power when Christ returns. So saith Daniel the prophet. And Rome is in control. Rome has always been in control. And Rome persecutes true Bible-believing Christians, those who call the papacy the Antichrist. The Albigensians, as as well as the Waldenses, believed and taught that the papacy was the man of sin, the Antichrist, and the Roman Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon. Okay? Now, if you can envision this, Henry Grattan Guinness, again, is, is, is giving lectures, lengthy, in-depth lectures over a period of weeks, and he's standing in front of a standing room only uh, audience an audience that spilled completely out into the streets, so much so that the people couldn't even hear him speak. And he holds up another book. Out, uh, Henry Grattan Guinness came to these lectures carrying the literature, the books, and the proof of what he was teaching. Here he stands in front of this crowd. He says, here is Sismondi's history of the Albigenses. On page 7, he says of them and of the Vaudois, the valley people, quote, all agreed in regarding the Church of Rome as having absolutely perverted Christianity 
and in maintaining that it was she who was designated in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, by the name of the Whore of Babylon. So here is another book, another Protestant book, another Bible-believing book who documents the belief of early believers. And it was universally agreed that the Church of Rome was, was portrayed in the Bible as the whore of Revelation chapter 17 and that the papacy was the Antichrist of the Bible. Now he says, Rome could not endure this testimony. She drew her deadly sword and waged war against those who bore it. In the year 1208, 1208, the Albigenses were murderously persecuted. That's right. Rome always persecutes those who call the papacy the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church the synagogue of Satan, the whore of Babylon. Rome always persecutes God's people when they tell the truth about Rome. Now, he says, in the year 1208, the Albigenses were murderously persecuted. Pope Innocent III, rather biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, Pope Innocent III, And here the author puts in parentheses what a mockery his name is, calling the Antichrist, calling himself innocent. Antichrist Innocent III employed the Crusaders in this dreadful work. All right, what are the Crusaders? Those are Roman Catholic nations, Roman Catholic peoples, Roman Catholic armies that are given by the Pope release from prison, release from obligation, release from sins, promised heaven to be their home if they will go fight and kill those people who call the Pope, the Antichrist, and the Roman Catholic Church, Babylon, the whore of Revelation chapter 17. Pope Innocent III, Antichrist Innocent III, employed the crusaders in this dreadful work. The war of extermination, that's right, Rome never leaves one heretic standing if she has the power to do it. The war of extermination was denominated sacred. That's right, a holy war. That's what Rome calls the persecution of God's people, a holy war. Remember the Bible says, and they that kill you will think they are doing God's service. It's a holy thing to them to kill true Bible-believing Christians, those who understand the prophecies and have marked the papacy as the fulfillment of the man of sin and the Roman Catholic Church, the whore of Revelation, chapter 17. Now, the Pope's soldiers prosecuted it, this crusade with pious ardor, Men, women, and children were all precipitated into the flames. Whole cities were burned. In Brazil's, every soul was massacred. That's right. They wiped out the entire city of Brazil's. 7,000 dead bodies were counted in a single church where the people had taken refuge. The whole country was laid waste. An entire people was slaughtered. And the eloquent witness of these early reformers was reduced to the silence of the sepulcher. Now, you have to ask yourself. I call myself a Protestant. I go to a church that calls itself Protestant. Yet no one in all my life, no matter how long we we each and every one of us have lived, in my case, nearly 60 years, No one in any of those Protestant churches ever apprised me of the history of the Roman Catholic Church and how she persecuted relentlessly to the scope of annihilation those who knew and taught the truth that the Pope is the Antichrist and the Church of Rome is the the whore of Babylon. But here is a massacre a crusade, a pious, holy war against men, women, and children. 
who were burned in flames. Whole cities burned. 7,000 in one single church. No one ever told me, and you must ask yourself the question, why is this not even mentioned in the churches today? Not so much even that so many were killed, but no word is ever mentioned about the papacy being the Antichrist. We're all taught about a future Antichrist that won't come just till just before Christ's return. Imagine the scope of the deception that has been levied, the conspiracy to silence true history, Protestant history, true Bible-believing history. Hundreds of millions of people have lost their lives in what were termed by Rome as crusades against Bible-believing Christians and you nor I have ever been told about it. It's absolutely essential to erase this history, get it out of the colleges, get it out of the schools, get it out of the churches, get it out of the government. No mention of it whatsoever, because were Protestants to ever rediscover the truth about Protestantism, what it really stood for, a protest against the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist and the counterfeit church called the Roman Catholic Church, if we ever were restored to our true heritage, our true history, and our true knowledge, and if we truly understood the prophecies the way the early Christians did, we would demand another Protestant Reformation. We would destroy futurism for the Jesuit hoax that it is, and we would put Christ on the throne and denounce Antichrist and demand that he take his mitts off of our government so that we might live Christ-like lives instead of being slaves to a man in Rome. That's right. You may not want to admit it to yourself, but everyone in this country wonders after the beast. We're never told that our government does not serve its people. It never was its intent to serve the people of this country, but to serve the Pope of Rome. But that's reality. You see yourself losing your liberties today? Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. Freedom to defend yourself. Freedom to have an attorney represents you in a court of law, freedom of privacy. They're all, each and every one of them, Protestant freedoms. It was Protestants in the colonial period that made sure that we had a Bill of Rights attached to the Constitution that guaranteed protection so that the Pope could never enslave us the way he did our Christian forefathers in Europe. The Bill of Rights is a Protestant document. There were colonies in this country that would not sign or ratify the Constitution of the United States unless there were guarantees put in place to protect Protestantism from papal tyranny and to prevent our government from becoming a slave to the Pope, just like all the governments of Europe were prior to the Protestant Reformation. Did anybody ever tell you that the Bill of Rights is a Protestant document that guarantees us Protestant liberty to protest the Antichrist and to question our government about its allegiances with Rome and demand that they throw off the papal yoke and rule this country from the behest of the people rather than the Antichrist of the Bible? That's what's happened. Now Rome's in control of Washington, D.C. She fears nobody. She's got control of Washington, D.C. She's got control of the economy. She's got control of the Federal Reserve Bank. She's got control of Congress. She's got control of the White House. She's got control of the Supreme Court. 
for the first time in American history, there's not one single Protestant on the, on the court, on the Supreme Court of this Constitution. And I remind you, the Supreme Court of this country is assigned the task of interpreting the Constitution. And you don't need me to tell you that somebody, six of the nine jurists on the Supreme Court are now interpreting the Constitution, and we're losing all of the Bill of Rights. And if I told people that the Pope controls that that Supreme Court, that the, all the Catholics on the Supreme Court now are duty-bound to obey the Pope and to do away with that Bill of Rights, that Bill of Rights that was specifically condemned by Pope Pius IX in 1864 in his encyclical and, and bull entitled <laughs> The Syllabus of Error. In 1864, Pope Pius IX damned our entire form of government, a representative form of government, a constitutional form of government, in favor of papal tyranny. Did anybody tell you that? Did your high school history teacher ever tell you about Pope Pius IX and the syllabus of error? Why not? Because Pope Pius IX has had his way. And only because you were never told that Pope Pius IX damned our Bill of Rights, that damned our Protestant liberties as pestilential heresies, that damned our form of representative form of government. Why didn't your American history book tell you this? Why did not your Protestant pastor tell you this? But you can look, and you don't need me to tell you, in the news every day, we le- in, the t- in the radio every day, we hear about our rights being taken away. And did you know it is the official teaching of Roman Catholic canon law that the only rights that man is to enjoy is those that the papacy grants and that he may take away those rights at his whim? That's the official teaching of Roman Catholic canon law. The Albigensians were right. The Waldenses were right. The papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible, persecuting God's people, crusade after crusade after crusade, denying them their rights, denying them of their property, making them slaves, and if they would not capitulate and worship the Pope, as the rest of Christendom did, they were burned at the stake, tortured beyond anyone's ability to comprehend. All of this is true. All of this is verifiable truth. Anybody with a modicum of intelligence and a computer and a dedicated mind can research these things for himself and doesn't need Inquisition Update or Tom Press or Walt Stickle to tell you the truth. It's still available to those who know where to find it. The Albigensians were nearly annihilated. 7,000 dead bodies were found in one single church in France where the people had taken refuge, where God's people had, had taken refuge, and the whole country was laid waste. The entire people was slaughtered. And the eloquent witness of these early reformers was reduced to the silence of the sepulcher. That's right. They especially go after the witnesses who might write the account of the bloody history of the annihilation of the Albigensians. They found them, and they killed them. And if they managed to publish a work, they managed to create a manuscript that could be made into a book, they sought them and burned them. 
Thus began the tremendous war against the saints foretold in Daniel, the prophet Daniel, and the apocalypse. And thenceforward, it was murderously prosecuted from century to century. How many centuries did Rome pursue God's people? Officially, 605 years, over 83 consecutive popes led crusades and inquisitions against God's people. 605 years over the terms of 83 consecutive popes. And they would have you believe, Rome would have you to believe, that there was only one inquisition. It was in Spain, and it killed 50 million. That's what Rome would have you believe. That's what Rome even admits. But the truth is staggering. The truth is staggering. He says, thus began the tremendous war against the saints foretold in Daniel and the Apocalypse. And thenceforward, it was murderously prosecuted from century to century. Early in the 13th century was founded the Inquisition and Full persecuting powers were entrusted by the popes to the Dominican order of monks. That's right, a whole order of the Roman Catholic Church, the Dominican monks, were given the charge to go from city to city offering rewards of indulgences and and ecclesiastical favors to turn in anybody who was believed to be a heretic. And when the when they, were, when they were known, the civil power, the government of the city or the nation would search these people out, haul them off to the Inquisition, and they were tortured, condemned, and burned at the stake. And this went on for 605 years. Does anyone seriously believe Rome only murdered 50 million of God's people? That was just in Spain, and Rome doesn't even deny it. A remnant of the Valdois, escaping from the south of France, took refuge in the Alps, where the light of the gospel had been preserved from the earliest times. From the earliest times. This is Paul's church. The Waldenses had preserved the gospel, had sought refuge from persecution in Rome, had sought refuge in the Alps, and had kept the prophecies of Daniel and of Paul and of John. And what did they preach? That the Pope was the Antichrist, and that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan, the whore of Revelation chapter 17, the persecutor of the saints, and would do so until Christ returned. That's what they preached. A remnant of the Valdois, escaping from the south of France, took refuge in the Alps, where the light of the gospel had been preserved from the earliest times. That's from apostolic times. Henry Grattan Guinness says, I have visited the Waldensian valleys and will try in a few words to bring them before you. You doubtless remember the position of the city of Milan in the the plain of Lombardy. From the top of the famous cathedral of Milan, there is a magnificent view of the southern Alps. The plains of Lombardy and Piedmont extend to their base. The Alps are seen stretching to the east and the west as far as the eye can reach. The sun at noon falls full upon their their crowned peaks. There they stand in rugged, wild sublimity, their lower slopes mantled with dark forests and their summits crowned with glaciers and eternal snows. To the west among these, beyond the city of Turin, rises the vast white cone of Monte Viso, Mount Viso. Among the mountains at its base lie the Waldensian valleys. They are five in number, and run up into narrow, elevated gorges, winding among fur-clad steeps and climbing into the region of the clouds, which hover around the icy alpine peaks. 
These valleys were the refuge of the Israel of the Alps. These valleys, these Waldensian valleys, these Alpine valleys were the refuge of the Israel of the Alps, they were called. Now, I want you listeners to write this down. The Israel of the Alps. Do a Google search, whatever search engine you prefer. Do a search for the Israel of the Alps. And then watch the video. It will make you weep. It will open your eyes more than I or anybody else could do. You're going to get to see those valleys. For the first church of Jesus Christ in Europe suffered 600 years of persecution by Rome and would have been annihilated if God had not preserved them. You're going to see what this man, Henry Grattan Guinness, is talking about. It's the most moving video I believe I've ever seen in my life. You're going to see the early apostolic church preserved as only God can preserve it holed up in the Alps and defended itself against the Roman horde, against the Antichrist of the Bible, against the whore of Babylon. I want you to see your Protestant history with your own eyes. I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to see it with your own eyes. These valleys were the refuge of the Israel of the Alps. Protestants Long before the Protestant Reformation, these noble mountaineers resolutely refused to bend the knee to Baal. They were a faithful remnant of the early church preserved all through the central ages of apostasy. And where did that apostasy originate? From the Roman Catholic Church. It was Rome who, who, who apostatized Christianity. That's where the great apostasy, the great falling away came. The Roman Catholic Church, prophecy fulfilled. Not in the future, but the distant past, the historical past. Right on time, those who followed Paul and were expectant of the Antichrist, just as soon as the Caesars left Rome, whoever stood up in his place would be the Antichrist. And sure enough, Within three to five centuries, the papacy was in full bloom, persecuting God's people, apostatizing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and making the Pope a mere man, a sinful man, Christ's replacement on earth, demanding all the power and strength of Christ, all right to rule, all right to define the Scriptures, all right to even dispense with the Bible completely if he wanted to. That's what it says in Roman Catholic canon law. The Pope is of so great dignity that he can even dispense with the Scriptures. Do away with them. And that's what he's done. And the whole world wonders after him, even the Protestant world. ecumenically reuniting with the papacy. They call it Christianity. Christians today call Roman Catholicism and the papacy Christianity. Imagine the apostasy that has overwhelmed God's people, God's people who once knew the truth. It's an incomprehensible horror. Back again to these Waldensian mountains in the Alps. It says, among the mountains at its base lie the Waldensian valleys. They are five in number, and they run up into narrow, elevated gorges, winding among fur-clad steeps and climbing into the region of the clouds, which hover around the icy alpine peaks. These valleys were the refuge of the Israel of the Alps. They were Protestants long before the Protestant Reformation. These noble mountaineers resolutely refused to bow the knee to Baal. They were a faithful remnant of the early church, preserved all through the central ages of apostasy. Who do you suppose 
preserve these ancient Waldensian Christians? Why, none other than Jesus Christ himself. No one else could have. When you learn the history of the Waldenses and the armies after army after army that the papacy hired to pursue these people and to annihilate them, you have to know. You just have to know that Jesus was preserving those people. He says, Henry Grattan Guinness again, in a lecture, holding up another book. Everybody says, Tom's always talking about all the books he reads. Here's Henry Grattan Guinness holding up another book in this lecture. He says, this folio volume is a faithful history of the Waldenses written 217 years ago. And remember, Henry Grattan Guinness was talking, was, was doing these lectures back in the 1850s, 1860s. This folio volume is a faithful history of the Waldenses written 217 years ago by the Waldensian pastor Leeger. It contains his portrait. I have often looked at it with interest. The countenance is scarred with suffering, but full of spiritual light. Leeger tells with simple clearness the story of the Waldenses from the earliest times, quoting from ancient and authentic documents. He gives in full their confession of faith. That's right. You're going to get to see what the Waldenses believed. You're going to get to see in their own writing this history of Leaguers. If you can get your hands on it, you can see with your own eyes what the Waldenses believed about the papacy and about the Roman Catholic Church. And remember, as you read, the Waldenses were preserving the gospel from the earliest times. This was an apostolic church. Preserved as only God could do it. He says he gives in full their confession of faith and narrates the history of their martyrdoms, including the dreadful massacre in the Vale of Lucerna, the Valley of Lucerna, in 1655, of which he himself was an eyewitness. This book was written only 14 years after that massacre. It contains numerous depositions concerning it, rendered on oath and long lists of the names of those who were its victims. It gives also plates depicting the dreadful ways in which they were slaughtered. In our generation, we've forgotten what plates are. Back in the old days, before the printing presses, if they were going to insert a photograph, as it were, in a book, they had to literally carve that portrait, that image, in reverse on a block of wood, a big, heavy block of wood. It had to be hand-carved in relief. And when it was finished, if it was, if it, if it was, if it was of good enough quality to use in the book, then they rolled it with ink, daubed it with ink, and then turned it over onto the pages and, and, and squeezed it in a press. And that's how they got pictures in the books and you've all seen those of you who are read some of these Protestant works have all seen these plates they were called plates he says it gives also plates depicting the dreadful ways in which they were slaughtered these plates represent men women and children being dismembered disemboweled ripped up run through with swords impaled on stakes, torn limb from limb, flung from precipices. That's right. They threw them from the rocks in the Alps down to the valleys below. And the rugged terrain was so rugged that they said that no one could recover the bodies and that their bodies just rotted and their, their bones lie bleaching in the sun in the Alps for decades afterwards. The Alps were literally sprinkled with the blood 
and the bones of these Waldensians. That's right, they were flung from precipices and even roasted in flames. That's how Rome treats heretics. This isn't unique just to the Waldenses. The treatment of Rome against those who call the Pope Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church, the whore of Revelation chapter 17, were treated likewise all throughout history. And she would do it again. She would do it tomorrow. She is doing it all over the, all over the world. And who's she doing it with? The United States of America. Shock and awe. Cruise missiles. Laser, space-based weapons. Every kind of nuclear and, and non-nuclear weapon, weaponry in the world today, the most sophisticated military in the world, can traipse all over this country in the name of the Pope and incinerate anyone they want, even one single person standing in a crowd. The Pope has unlimited power now. And it's the United States government, the United States military that wields that power. The history that we're reading in this book now is so big in our current generation that we hardly recognize it for what it is. But we use this example of the pursuit and the crusade led against the Waldenses to get an understanding of what is happening today, right before our eyes, talked about on all the radio stations, talked about on all the television stations, talked about in all the newspapers, talked about in every venue of communication in this country, but no one sees the similarities of what's happening today in comparison to what happened to these Waldenses nearly a thousand years ago. But it's the same beast, the same Antichrist, the same whore. It's only the United States of America that's now in bed with her doing her bidding around the world. That's right, they were dismembered, disemboweled. That's right, they ripped their stomachs open and laid their guts out for them to see with their own eyes before they died. Sorry to be so graphic, but you would have to comprehend what we're talking about here. They were ripped up. They were run through with swords, impaled on stakes, torn limb from limb, and flung from precipice, even roasted in flames. That's right. Rome doesn't just kill heretics. She makes blood sport of heretics. She revels in the torture and mutilation and annihilation of God's people as you would imagine even Satan would if he could. And that's exactly who's doing it, and he's doing it through the papacy and the United States of America. Strong medicine? You better take it. You better take it down. Get it all down. Don't leave any. If you want a remedy for what ails the Christians in this country, you better take this strong medicine and you better take it all down. Lift the spoon, because if you cut short and you fail to comprehend what we're really up against in this country, you'll be the victim just like the Waldenses were, just like the Albigensians were, just like all Christians throughout history who understood the prophecies and saw its fulfillment in history, distant history now. They were also too horrible to look at, these plates in Leaguer's book. Too horrible to look at. And this was only one of a long series of massacres of the Waldenses, extending through 600 painful years. Let me be precise and correct, Henry Grattan Guinness, 605 years and 83 consecutive popes. Here's another book Henry Grattan Guinness is holding up to the crowd. He said Milton wrote these Protestant sufferers, wrote of these Protestant sufferers his immortal sonnet. And I'll do the best I can. I'm not a poet. 
but this is the, one of the most moving Protestant poet poems I've ever read in my life. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold. Even them who kept thy truth so pure of old. When all our fathers worshipped stocks and stones and popes and priests. Forget not in thy book, record their groans who were thy sheep. And in their ancient folds, slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled, mother with infant down the rocks, their moans. The veils redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. Their martyred blood and ashes sow o'er all the Italian fields, where still doth sway the triple tyrant, that from these may grow a hundredfold, who having learned thy way, Early may they fly the Babylonian woe, unquote. Who is the triple tyrant spoken of by Milton here? Why, the one who wears the triple crown, the Pope, the Babylonian woe. The persecuted Waldenses were students of prophecy from the oldest times, How did they interpret the prophecies concerning Babylon and the man of sin? Here in this book of Leaguers, he's returning back to Leaguers' book now. Here in his book of Leaguers is their treatise on Antichrist, written in the year 1120 or nearly 800 years ago. 800 years ago, God's people knew who the Antichrist was. It says it is written in a language now extinct, and I can even tell you what that language was. It was called the Ramount language. It was a Latin version that is no longer spoken. It was only spoken by the Waldensians, and the Vatican made sure that that language died with the Waldensians because if anyone could speak it or anyone could read it, They could read the works of the Waldenses and interpret it for themselves. And one copy survived, and it was translated into the French, and God preserved it, just as he preserved his people, the Waldenses. He says, Leaguer gives a French translation in parallel columns. Here it is at page 71. In simple telling terms, That treatise brands the Romish church as the harlot Babylon and the papacy as the man of sin and Antichrist. That was the faith and confession of the Waldenses. That's what they believed. That's what they taught. That's what they wrote. And God preserved it. Should we ignore it and continue to believe in futurism? Or should we believe what God has preserved and return to historicism and agree with that church that Jesus Christ himself miraculously preserved? Should we believe the way they believe that the Roman Catholic Church is Babylon and the papacy the man of sin? That's what I'm going to believe. You do as you please, as the Lord leads, but that's what I believe, and no one could ever destroy that belief. For 15 years, I've studied day and night Protestant works, Protestant books. I know what they believe. No one can shake my mind as to what all Christians believed prior to about three or four generations ago. I believe it. History demands that I believe it. The Bible and prophecy demand that I believe it. Now here, the author gives us a lengthy quote of this work, this Waldensian work entitled Treatise on Antichrist. It's in the French. Would to God that I could read this to you but I can't read French. But I guarantee you, if you can read French and you you get a hold of this book, 
You can read this for yourself, and it will tell you what the Waldenses believe, that the Pope is the Antichrist of the Scripture, the papacy is the Antichrist of the Scripture, and Roman Catholicism is counterfeit Christianity. It's a false Christianity. It's not Christianity at all. It's Baal worship. The same apostasies that the Israelites committed, we have committed. In accepting the Roman Catholic Church as a Christian denomination or anything resembling Christianity is equivalent to committing the apostasies and the whoredoms of Israel. And if God punished Israel, he must punish us. God is no respecter of persons. And now could anybody guess who is going to punish us for our apostasy? Why the very whore that prosecuted and persecuted the Waldenses and the Albigenses. We have failed to remember that history, and now we will have it repeated. And the only ones that are going to survive are those who God preserves, just like he preserved the Waldenses. There's a consequence for the level of apostasy that has taken over, quote-unquote, Christianity today. There are consequences. And Rome now controls our government. Roman Catholics even control your school board. That's why your history books make no mention of Protestant history. They've long since gotten control of this country. And you could have figured this out on your own had your pastor given you the slightest inkling about what's really going on in this country. If your government would have given you the slightest inkling about what's going on in this country, if the mainstream media would have given you even the slightest inkling about what's really going on in this country, but they'll have you all worried about the Muslims, the Islamists, or the economy, or GMO foods, or health care, or anything else to get your attention, but they'll never even allude to the history of the Roman Catholic Church or the apostasy, or rather the death of Protestantism in this country and around the world. To be Protestant is to protest Antichrist. To protest Antichrist, you must know who he is. All Protestants before our generation did know who the Antichrist was, and they protested. That's why they died. We're done talking about the Waldenses now for a moment. Henry Grattan Guinness is going to move on to another preserved church. This time it was a Reformed church. These people were originally Roman Catholic, whereas the Waldenses were apostolic. They were called the Bohemians. He says, turn now for a, mo- for a few moments to Bohemia. You remember that it is an extensive province in the northwest of Austria. There, a Reformation sprang up more than a century before the time of Martin Luther. He continues, he says, and was quenched in seas of blood. Who quenched that Reformation, that early Reformation by these Bohemians? Why Rome, the Antichrist, the one who always persecutes God's people. You see, these Bohemians lived righteous in Christ Jesus. They not only knew Jesus, they knew his counterfeit, and they condemned him and Rome wiped them out. What gave rise to it? The testimonies of John Huss and Jerome of Prague. 
What did these men hold as to the Church of Rome and the papacy? That Rome is Babylon and the papacy the Antichrist. And now, the author is going to give us a note with John Huss's own words. Listen to what he says. Quote, an epistle of John Huss unto the people of Prague. The more circumspect ye ought to be, for that Antichrist laboreth the more to trouble you. The last judgment is near at hand. Death shall swallow up many, but to the elect children of God, the kingdom of God draweth near. Know ye, well beloved, that Antichrist being stirred up against you deviseth diverse persecutions, unquote. This quote from John Huss can be found in a work that was originally entitled Acts and Monuments, now known as Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 3, pages 497 and 498. Here, another quote from John Huss, an early reformer. Before Protestantism was cool, John Huss wrote to the Lord John de Clune. He says, quote, By your letter, which I received yesterday, I understand first how the iniquity of the great strumpet, that is, of the malignant congregation, what is this malignant congregation, this cancerous congregation that spreads? Why Rome, right? He says, I understand first how the iniquity of the great strumpet, that is, of the malignant congregation whereof mention is made in the apocalypse is detected and shall be more detected with which strumpet the kings of the earth do commit fornication fornicating spiritually from Christ and as is there said sliding back from the truth and consenting to the lies of antichrist through his seduction and through fear or through hope of confederacy, forgetting of worldly honors, unquote. Acts and Monuments, Volume 3, page 499. Here's another quote from John Huss, the very words of a Protestant reformer. Quote, letter of John Huss, wherein he comforteth his friends and willeth them not to be troubled for the condemning of his books, and also declareth the wickedness of the clergy. Another quote, quote, Master John Huss, in hope, the servant of God, to all the faithful who love him and his statutes, wisheth the truth and grace of God. Surely, even at this day, is the malice, the abomination, and filthiness of Antichrist revealed in the Pope and others of this council. Oh, how acceptable a thing it should be if time would suffer me to disclose their wicked acts, which are now apparent, that the faithful servants of God might know them. I trust in God that he will send, <clears throat> he will send after me those that shall be more valiant. And there are alive at this day that shall make more manifest the malice of Antichrist and shall give their lives to the death for the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall give both you and to me the joys of life everlasting. Another quote. This epistle was written upon uh, St. John Baptist Day in prison and in cold irons. I, having this meditation with myself, that John was beheaded in his prison and bonds for the word of God. That's right. God revealed to John Huss that the revelator, John the revelator, was beheaded in prison. And he records it in Acts and Monuments, Volume 3, page 502 and 503. What did the pre-Protestant Reformation Christians believe? You ought to know by now. And if you don't know, you're not listening. He says, witness their testimony. Quoted by Fox, the martyrologist. I have stood on the spot in Constance where these men were condemned to death. Rome burned them. 
here is a history of the Protestant Reformation and the anti-Reformation in Bohemia. That's right. Henry Grattan Guinness wasn't just interested in what the Protestant Reformers believed. He was interested in what the anti-Reformation of the Council of Trent, the Jesuit-led Council of Trent, was up to. What Christian today, what Protestant today ever hears a word about the Jesuits? What Protestant today ever hears about what the Council of Trent was about? Did you know that the Council of Trent was led by the Jesuit order, and it was an all-out declaration of war, of annihilation against Protestantism? Did your pastor ever tell you that? Did your high school history teacher ever tell you that? Did your social studies teacher ever tell you that? Did your government ever tell you that? Did anybody in the mainstream or alternative medias ever tell you that? The Council of Trent ran for 65 years. It, it was called by the Jesuit order. It was a concerted effort by the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic monarchs of Europe and the Roman Catholic prelates of the Vatican to determine how the best way it would be to undo the Protestant Reformation and that was to destroy the Protestant belief that the papacy is the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan, the horror of Revelation chapter 17. Guess how they did it? Why, they made no mention of the papacy from then on. They taught in all the seminaries that the Antichrist wouldn't come until the last seven years, just before Christ returned. You don't have to worry about it. You're probably not going to live long enough to see him. Neither are your children nor your grandchildren. You can relax about Antichrist and you can ecumenically reunite with the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church so that we could all be as one, just as Jesus prayed. That's how Rome is selling ecumenism. The whole entire ecumenical movement the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation, Futurism, all of it was hatched at the Council of Trent. All of it was hatched at the Council of Trent. Rome knew how she was going to destroy the Protestant Reformation simply by getting you and all your pastors to go along with it and to believe in a future Antichrist and then make it a game, a sport, to hunt for Antichrist when the Antichrist is on television every day, still giving orders to the kings of the earth. It's, it's almost impossible to believe the scope of how we have been deceived in our generation. And we see how God so seemingly mercilessly punished the Jews for going a whoring after other gods, and we expect to be treated differently. When our apostasy, our deception, our whoring after the Pope, is even less forgivable because we've got the entire revelation of Scripture and we've got the entire revelation of 2,000 years of history that the Jews never had. Be careful if you ever condemn the Jews for their apostasy, for turning away from God after he miraculously led them through the Red Sea defended them against their enemies, spoke to them from the mountains because we've been delivered even more miraculously. We've got a bigger Bible than they ever had. We have the truth. We possess the truth. And yet, we go a whoring after our Pharaoh just as the Israelites did. It's a horrible 
reality. And we have to face it and repent or suffer their fate. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.